Welcome to the I Am the Cavalry track, 10th edition. Say happy birthday for a decade. Um, I am not Jen Ellis. So you might have seen when you were deciding to come here that Jen Ellis is going to be the lead speaker. But sadly, Jen got stuck in the UK, and we're all sending her hugs. She has recorded a little bit of an address for us. And uh, Bo and I will do our best to augment the things she did not say. Um, but uh, this track uh, is going to, we're going to basically do a little bit of a reflection on where we were 10 years ago, what's happened over the last 10 years, and maybe what could be the next, the future here in this first opening orientation. But also, we're going to um, try to give a little bit of a preview of what you would see if you come here. And if this is your first time in the cavalry track, some people come and go a la carte, some people really benefit from the contiguous experience because several of the talks were chosen and sequenced to build upon each other and cross-reference each other. So um, I will probably go last, um, but I'm Josh Corman. I'm Bo Woods. And Jen Ellis will introduce herself um, via video. But um, yeah, 10 years ago here, we gave birth to I Am the Cavalry, the idea that the cavalry isn't coming, the co-, co Founder was Nick Prococo. At the same time, Bo was giving his own talk, and we met in a lot of uh, green room afterwards. But the idea is our dependence on connected technology was growing a lot faster than our ability to secure it in areas affecting public safety, human life. That was my raison d'etre. Nick was pretty concerned about the increased criminalization of research, and Snowden just happened. So, you know, it was uncertain times where I both felt that we were powerless and at risk of being further marginalized, but also that the world needed us more than they ever did. And we asked if people would work together and try some radically uncomfortable experiments to use empathy and a long view and meet people where they are in safety critical industries to try to make the world safer sooner if we work together. We had a slightly bigger scope than we've ended up in deploying, but we said, if you like this idea, meet us at DerbyCon in eight weeks and we'll do a uh, constitutional Congress to identify our mission, vision, goals. So we're not gonna do the entire history here. I just went through quite a bit of it on the up, uh, upstairs keynote. Um, but we do wanna make sure you understand what, why we're here today uh, and what we're gonna be doing today and tomorrow. And to do so, um, if I can get this thing working again, um, Jen couldn't be here in person, but she does wanna share her thoughts. Uh, this is not Jen, this is Andrea. And Bo's seeing this for the first time. So he may disagree with everything that Jen has to say. Okay. Fingers crossed. Hi, B-Siders. I'm so sorry that I'm not able to be there with you, but I hope you guys have an amazing time out in Vegas. Um, not sure that I'm that envious given the current heat wave and everything, but I hope it's a good time for you guys. Um, I just want to really congratulate everybody. Uh, 10 years on the cavalry is amazing. Um, when I think about some of the milestones that you guys have hit or that the cavalry's hit in that time and some of the impact that's been created, I just, I think it's really phenomenal. And I think when you look past the 10 years and like what's changed in that time, I do think you can see the sort of sticky fingerprints of um, the cavalry members on um, on some of that evolution that is so important and impactful for how we think about um, security risk across society. Um, so for those who don't know, I'm Jen Ellis, hi. Um, I uh, work really closely with governments around the world and nonprofits around the world to um, try to think about how we create behavioral change that reduces security risk on a societal level. Um, and like weirdly, I've been sort of in the background involved in the cavalry since the very, very beginning, but it was all a bit of a coincidence on timing, really. So like, come with me as we go back, back through time. Um, so 10 years ago, uh, I was um, working for a security vendor and I was um, supporting a, a security research team um, and working really closely with them. And um, one of our research leads was threatened with legal action for a research project that I'd been really closely involved in with him. And it was all a bit stressful, as I imagine that you can relate. Um, 
And it didn't sort of lead to anything terrible, but the whole process was so stressful that he sort of said, I don't know if I want to do research anymore. And I was kind of like, yep, I get that. But at the same time, there's a sort of consumer rights issue here because, you know, research is the thing that arms uh, consumers to make informed decisions to manage their own risk, right? And, and I was like, what are we going to do if researchers feel like they can't do research? And so I started to look into it more. I learned about the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. I learned about the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. I learned about state hacking laws and what impact all of this was creating um, for researchers in the US and then sort of anti-hacking laws around the world that are very similar, that are also creating a chilling effect on researchers. And I got indignant and, a, and an indignant gen is a bad gen. And I was like, something's gotta be done. And even though I, like um, I have no policy background, no law background. And in fact, I'm not, as you probably gathered from my accent, actually American. I decided that I was gonna be the one to go and change it. Um, and so I started to talk to some other people who kind of maybe felt strongly about this too and tried to sort of think about how we could go and engage policymakers. And that all started 10 years ago. Um, and weirdly, at the same time, Josh was going through his own sort of um, process of like realization and awakening around the risk that existed in society where um, physical and virtual meet and have the potential to create harm. I'm sure we've all heard Josh say uh, where bits and bites meet flesh and blood um, a thousand times. If you're playing Josh Corman, bingo, I am here for you. Um, <laughs> So we were at a conference and Josh and I were just catching up and he was talking about what he was doing. And I was like, oh, that's kind of weird because I've also started doing government engagement recently on this thing. And what we realized was that the two initiatives, while separate and, and had come from separate places, were going to be super, super, super complementary to each other. Um, you know, every time I went and I met a policymaker and I said, hey, um, security research is being chilled by the current legislative uh, landscape, they would look at me and it was a little bit like I'd said, um, we need to build a rocket ship to the moon. And they were like, what's the moon? <laughs> um, and my ability to answer that question, what is security research and why does it matter, was really aided by the cavalry, right? I was able to go, well, for example, when you look at cars, uh, let's think about how much software is in cars. And, and, and most people don't know these things, right? They don't think about things in these terms. And in fact, at the time when we started, automakers weren't thinking of themselves as technology manufacturers. They told me directly they weren't. And so, you know, having the conversation around cybersecurity with people who don't think of themselves as software companies is, is really hard. And, and talking to legislators about that kind of stuff is really hard. But every time I met a researcher through the cavalry, who was working in one of these areas of, you know, potential harm. And like, the thing that's cool is, you know, obviously it's terrible, the level of harm, but they're very relatable areas to talk about. If you talk about a medical device or you talk about a car or you talk about a plane, everybody knows what that is. Everybody's interacted with them in some way, shape or form. They've seen them on TV. They're very tangible and they can understand the potential for harm in a way that when you're talking about, for example, the confidentiality part of the CIA triad, it doesn't engage people outside of security in the same way. It doesn't get them sort of like going, oh, I see what the impact for society is going to be. So being able to, to talk to researchers in the cavalry and, and like learn from some of the work that they were doing and the conversations they were having in the sectors and then pulling that over onto the, the policy side to talk about the impact of research, the importance of research, why research was actually hugely valuable to society was really, really helpful. And I, and I hope and I think that the conversations that we were having there about that role of researchers and the importance of researchers also sort of fed the cavalry's ability to engage with them. We opened like lots of doors and sort of tried to say, hey, you should really meet these people. I took a number of people who were involved with the cavalry in to meet with policymakers. Um, and then over time, there have been many, 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 many more touch points that have been created, which is amazing. And I mean, if you look where we're sitting today, B-Sides has now for a long time had policymakers coming and participating. I think I was one of the early people to, to drag policymakers with me to come speak with me. Um, but now it's like quite a habitual thing. And I know that you've got 
sort of members of the FDA who will be speaking in the cavalry track. I imagine there are probably there's some people coming over from the UK government who are talking about related topics. Um, I think you'll have many others from the government sitting in the audience, if not speaking as as part of the the talks. And common ground often has um, policy content, but that's not all, right? Black Hat has a dedicated policy track. DEFCON has policy at DEFCON, which is huge this year, really huge, like two separate tracks and then a roundtables room, like it's uh, it's loads. And we're seeing it now spill out into other areas. One of the things the cavalry has always been a part of and has backed has been Hackers on the Hill, an initiative to help security people get experience of going and briefing um, policymakers. And those touch points are critical because, you know, at the end of the day, Cyber crime is estimated to cost the the global go, uh, global economies around seven trillion dollars a year, right? Which is like almost three times the GDP of the UK. Just to give you an idea, yes, the UK is much smaller than the US, but still, um, it's quite a big number. And so, like, you know, the governments are going to be paying attention. You know, the governments are going to be trying to do stuff on cyber security and cyber crime and cyber risk and so if we can put the people who live and breathe this every day the people who are doing the research who are doing the jobs who are working on the front lines of this in touch with those policymakers, and then we can try and avoid unintended harms or outcomes we can try and make the policy fit for purpose as much as possible so i think it's really critical that there is this relationship and that the cavalry has engaged with uh, governments in the way that it has, and the cavalry has taken a position of leadership around so much. I mean, you know, things like the Patch Act, um, the some of the things that have been done that weren't direct policy engagement, but they helped influence policy engagement. Things like um, the the um, uh, the the Five Star Auto, for example. You know, those kinds of things have then kind of been fed into sector specific people. I mean, the work that the cavalry has done with the FDA has been phenomenal and huge props to the FDA team on the other side of that, who have just shown astonishing leadership over the past 10 years on these on these topics. Um, so, you know, I don't I don't want to sort of, you know, belabor the point, but I do want to just say I think when I look now, you know, 10 years ago, people were like policymakers don't want to hear from us. And I could see why people felt that way, right? And now I look at things, I look at the landscape and I'm like, yeah, there are still problems. It's still hard to know who to talk to and when to talk to them. But no one can say policymakers don't want to talk to the security community anymore. There is demonstrable evidence that they do because they're coming to us, they're coming to our conferences. And they're doing that so that they can meet more people and talk to more people. And I think that engagement and that potential to create impact is incredible. And it really speaks to some of the work that's been done and the and the trust that's been built and the solid foundation, the groundwork that's been established to show how productive those relationships can be. And also to show that we can be trusted partners, right? We can collaborate. We don't have to be just, you know, trolls on the internet that criticize and have no interest in working on making things better. And I think that is all really, really positive. One of the things I love about the cavalry so much is it's not just about pointing out problems, it's about finding solutions. It's about that collaborative effort working forward together. So I just want to say again, a huge congratulations to everyone who's worked on that. The work is not done. There is more to do, but there's also so much more opportunity now to engage and to create influence. And I think that's amazing. So I hope that all of you will feel really inspired to go on and to continue and to think about how you can play a role. And um, and I say good luck and I look forward to it and let me know how I can help. Enjoy the rest of B-Sides. Thanks very much. Bye. Okay, so that's Jen. We'll take feedback to her. She can't hear you right now, even though it felt like she was in the room. Um, and fun fact, as we pivot to Bo's reflections, uh, Jen did not see the call to action. Even though she knew what we were building and kind of helped advise on what we were building, she was across town at Black Hat doing a super secret meeting that never happened, uh, establishing trust with people about hacker lawfulness um so she never heard the call to action and has been one of the top contributors for a decade now that takes some 
stamina uh, and uh, treasure her. So someone else who did not see the call to action but has also been in the top trio of making the world a safer place is Bo. Why didn't you see the top? <laughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, I, at, at the same time, I was in a different room giving a talk uh, about how to uh, let go of responsibility and like go travel around the world, um, which was fun for a little while, but this is a lot more fun and more <laughs> meaningful. Uh, so uh, I guess I let Josh convince me to uh, quit doing that and, and to come in. And out of curiosity, how many people in here uh, were also not in that talk that first year at B-Sides? So the majority of people. I think the lesson we can take from this is that there's a lot more people who were not in that room who are helping to change the world. Yes. Uh, which is awesome, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a testament to how far we have come. Um, and I don't know. We, we didn't plan this, by the way. Uh, because, you know, we kind of had some last minute stuff. But do you... Uh, you pulled something oh, no, up. No, no, no. You, know you have you something. Know okay. Yeah. You, you, you should take about the same time she did. So. Okay. Um, so as I've been thinking back in the last 10 years... Like 10 years ago, what did we tend to hear about when you had, you know, the so-called adults in the room talking about stuff? It was banks and uh, the electric grid. And that was basically it. Films, I think uh, Sony had just gotten hit because of the Seth, uh, the, the film about North Korea. Um, and that was that was a, a lot of it. Like if you if you talk to policymakers or anybody about uh Oh, I see you're doing a montage. You can ignore it. Um, Look how young he looks. <laughs> oh, the camels. Um, if you talk to policymakers uh, or others, like they hadn't really thought about security implications of Internet of Things. They hadn't really thought about, they didn't realize that computers were in cars. Um, so a lot of the things that we had to do back then uh, to make things relatable today, that situation has totally changed. Um, so it was, was it, when did uh, CyberMed Summit happen in the hotel room? The year, do no harm, the first do no harm. That's yeah, what um, I think it was your two or three of our birthday. Yeah. 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 So this would have been like 2014, 2015. Um, we have some very awesome doctor friends of ours who are also hackers. Uh, they've given talks at uh, DEF CON and also saved people's life in the emergency room. Um, and uh, they're like, hey, we should just like have a conversation about medical device security, about healthcare security. Like there's some really serious issues there. It's gonna get people killed. Uh, and we're like, all right, cool. What do we wanna do? Like, well, let's get some people together. I was like, all right, that's cool. You know. Tuscany has great big hotel rooms. We could just do it in my room. Next thing I know, I get, I see a tweet go out like, hey, Tuscany, this room, everybody just show up. And I'm like, oh shit. So I'm like, okay, I, I guess we got to prepare for this. Um, so I like uh, emptied out my bathtub. I hadn't showered in it and put a bunch of ice in there. Went and made like 10 trips to the ice machine, got a bunch of beers and threw them in there. And we had probably 20 people sitting around in uh, a hotel room, just having some really, really, uh, interesting conversations about medical devices, healthcare security, um, some really, really good people in there who uh, still to this day are doing amazing things in medical devices. And we um, formed an idea uh, to do what we call the CyberMed Summit. I'm just gonna wander and ramble on this. Um, and uh, we, we came up with this idea to do clinical simulations where you put doctors in a room to treat a patient, the doctor doesn't know what's gonna to happen to them. They don't know it's gonna be something cybersecurity related, uh, but they've got a support staff that has a script. You've got a patient who's a professional actor who does these things all the time. Um, and so we, we did this really amazing thing where uh, we killed someone on stage. Uh, we killed someone in an operating room, but not for real, but we simulated it. Um, and it was incredibly powerful. Uh, if you've if you've never seen what happens in an actual emergency room, it's worth going and finding some of these videos online. Uh, we had that first year we had Nightline did a story about it. 
Um, so like, you know, major primetime news does an eight minute segment on how we killed people and, and uh, made sure that that didn't happen in the real world. The next year, I think somebody else came out. Hearst came out and mm -hmm. did a story on us. Uh, Hearst is one of the biggest um, uh, print media. Uh, they have print TV and uh, radio media. Uh, a lot of your local news stations are owned by Hearst. Uh, we've had a lot of others pick it up. Um, but anyways, it was, it was super cool, super powerful. We tweeted about it. And then I think I got on a plane from there. We did it in Arizona. I got on a plane from there and flew over to Germany for an automotive conference. Um, speaking of, you know, Jen mentioned, uh, Jen mentioned the automotive side of it. And uh, so like I landed, I went to the venue, it was the night before, so I had like the speakers uh, party or whatever. And um, I was just going around and talking to people and this one person was like, hey, you know, I heard about this really cool thing that somebody just did in the US where uh, they, they had a, a simulated clinical thing. I'm, I'm looking at this person. I'm like, you're clearly trolling me because you know that I was just there and that I he's did in it. the room. <laughs> and uh, he's like, so just let him go on and describe it. And I was like, this is really cool. And I was like, are you are you saying that because you know I was there? He's like, wait, you were there, but now you're here. And uh, that's going to be one of our speakers later on oh. today, I believe, or tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and the British are coming. Um, that person, David Rogers, who's sitting right there. Um, uh, has also been one of the loudest, maybe not loudest voices, but certainly one of the most impactful people at getting uh, IoT security governance put into public policy around the world. Um, I won't steal his thunder for tomorrow. Uh, you should come and listen to it. But it's, it's really, really cool. Uh, and a lot of the global public policy around IoT security is because uh, you know, somebody from the hacking community was like, hey, you know what? I think we can do better. Uh, I'm going to see if I can make that happen uh, and brought us all into that process um, to be able to to put things together in a way that's compatible with uh, with public policy. And I think there's a lot of stories like that, a lot of threads like that that have happened over the last decade where one thing led to another thing. It cascaded, it snowballed. Um, people uh, heard about this idea uh, started believing that it could happen, uh, eventually um, changed internal roles in their organization so that they could be on the product side rather than on the internal security side. And that happened at least a couple of times. Kyle uh, did it at Tesla. Um, this guy? And yeah, that guy. Um, and then um, Colin at J&J. &J. Yep. Mike Murray. At Mike G. Murray. Yeah. Um, and like those are seemingly small transitions, but when you think about what it takes to get a multi-billion dollar company to change what they're doing, um, that's actually massive. Uh, and I think it's, it's been understated, you know, they're not up giving talks about those types of things because largely you can't talk about what goes on inside companies like that, but they've been some of the most influential and powerful change agents. Uh, and while Josh and I are up on stage blabbing about all this stuff they're actually going out and, and doing it and making it happen. Um, and so there's a lot of things where uh, a sequence of events comes together that couldn't have happened otherwise. Um, and it's amazing to just see all the progress that's happened over the last decade, uh, both from people in our community, as well as on the public policy side, uh, some of the policymakers who have changed. Um, we had, uh, so Josh and I in 2016, um, went into an organization, a think tank in DC called the Atlantic Council. And at a certain point, we got this intern. Oh, um, yes. And this intern was kind of incredible. Like on paper, I was like, wait a minute, you've got a law degree and like a couple of master's degrees. Why are you interning? Like, <laughs> it's like, well, you know, I'm waiting for my clearance to go into to government. It's like, okay. Uh, cool, well, you already know a ton, so we're just gonna like put you to work and like we're not gonna have you running and getting coffee like a lot of interns. We're gonna have you like, I don't know, you wanna figure out how to get members of Congress out to DEF CON? Um, and so uh, she did and uh, did a great job of it. 
um, went and put together all the paperwork, managed to figure out how to navigate the labyrinthine congressional ethics rules. And so we brought a couple of members of Congress out to DEF CON, Will Hurd uh, and Jim Langevin. Um, and they were two of the loudest voices in Congress on cybersecurity issues. Uh, after that three month period or whatever, I think she eventually got her ability to go in uh, to government um, and ended up, I, I, I'm trying to remember the sequence of events. She ended up, uh, was it the newly formed, then newly formed CISA for a little while um, and did that and did just phenomenal work. Uh, she later dragged us in uh, to CISA or helped drag us into CISA to work on the COVID task force. Uh, but now she's at the White House helping to write strategies and implementation plans. Um, and she's not alone on the policy side. There's a number of folks that we started working with just a long time ago when they were junior staffers, but they were super interested, really passionate, wanted to learn because they wanted to do better. Um, and now they're also in just amazing roles like uh, legislative directors for members of Congress or uh, taking roles in the White House. Um, the, the new national cyber director role uh, that has come about, many of you know about it. If you don't know about it, uh, it's basically somebody who reports to the president and their only job is to think about cybersecurity issues. And they have a large team. I think they've got 80 to 90 people on staff now. Um, and they rated some of the best people from Congress uh, to go and do that. Some of the best staffers, as well as other people, people who had been you know, formerly in the White House. Um, so a lot of those policymakers have made that journey as well, both the elected and appointed individuals, as well as their staffers. Uh, and you just see these folks level up continually from being fairly junior, but curious, passionate about something. They look a lot like us, actually, um, not in the you know Mohawk sense, uh, or in the kilt wearing sense, but in the sense that they're young, they're energetic, they're curious, they're smart, they're creative, they're talented, uh, and they go really, really far in their careers. Um, that wasn't the case a decade ago. I think 10 years ago when we went and started talking to, to folks in Congress, there were actually more members of Congress with a degree in computer science than there were staffers. And there's like five times to 10 times as many staffers as there are members. Um, and it was just accidental that those members were uh, had computer science degrees because they were you know business owners they ran businesses and, and got into politics that way uh, but today i think that um, almost all members of congress have somebody who part of their portfolio is cybersecurity. i can't think of anybody who doesn't and many of those have computer science degrees or they have a technical background. They know about technology uh, and they're serving uh, their, um, their version of public good. Uh, they're doing public service in that way. Uh, and so from all sides, the world has changed in a decade and changed in a lot of ways for the better. Um, but the faster we get better, uh, the amount of things that have been connected that have been had software added to them um, has also grown and probably grown faster than we could possibly hope to to do better with just looking at uh, a single community or a single approach. And so part of the original uh, thesis of I am the cavalry was we have to, to fuzz the chain of influence, figure out what works, repeat that, and then avoid the stuff that doesn't work or, you know, tweak it and try again. Uh, but to be kind of relentless on pursuing this. Um, and so we found a lot of stuff that's really cool and that works after a decade. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about that tomorrow afternoon. Um, we found some stuff that doesn't work so great. And so when others want to go in and do things, we want to help them avoid those things. Um, there's some things that others have tried that uh, have been have worked really, really well. Uh, Ray and the audience here um, worked on uh, at state level, how do you form teams of people who can go in and help during a crisis or uh, can be the go to when you need to talk to, to people in policy at the state level. So there's a lot of stuff that has happened in the last decade. There's a lot of stuff still to come. All right. Um, I was doing a little bit of visual support. Um, so 
it turns out there was a lot of confusion about the keynote, so I didn't want to repeat much between what I did, but very few of you saw it. So just a couple looking back highlights. I think um, I'm going to read a very short comment from our day one co-founder who is not here in Vegas this year. Um, so I did not read that upstairs, but I will read it now. So this is Nick Prococo, C75. He used to be at, uh, well, he, he runs, well, he started ThoughtCon. I don't know, I think he's still involved, but um, he was at Spider Labs at the time. And of all the people that I was socializing my crazy idea to before I chickened out, um, he, he really stepped up and thought that we could not just use our skills for our employers or for our hobby, but maybe for the greater good. Um, so, but for his teaming with me early, I don't think I would have had the nerve to do these talks and uh, launch this here August 1st, 10 years ago. Um, and DEF CON the following Sunday, we got the main stage. After being rejected, uh, Jeff Moss said, we gotta put you guys on stage. So uh, we got the keynote stage on Sunday morning again. So we did this talk twice. But um, as we grew and changed and focused more on public safety, human life, and a little bit less on his stuff, he was less involved, but has always been a, a good touch touchstone. Um, if you're at the launch um, or and or the uh, the original call to action, um, we had talked about our general concerns or the three planks of a platform were um, essentially body, mind, and soul. Like I was deeply concerned about public safety, human life, and the increasingly connected technologies. Uh, he was deeply concerned about the preservation of lawful research in our profession. And so was Jen, as you heard from her comments. And uh, and I was also concerned about preservation, the intersection between technology and, and civil liberties or human um, soul, basically, body, mind, soul. Um, as Bo and I really decided to make the front line, tip of the arrow, public safety, human life, where bits and bites meet flesh and blood, I never wanted to let go of any, but we kind of did a turducken where by saying we can help the public safety, public good, they're like, oh my God, how can we help? And Congress really cared and they would lean in and we said, well, for one, there's a chilling effect on good faith research. And they said, oh yeah, yeah, we can help with that. So we took the side door while Jen and others took the front door. So I think we never really let go of number two for Nick, but um, here's his remark, and I can't speak like he does, uh, but it says, in the past decade, since the creation of this movement, the world has changed in ways we could not have fully predicted. We knew that information security community wasn't headed to the place we thought they should be in five years, 10 years, or even 20 years by mostly ignoring the side of technology that mattered the most, human lives. The goal of changing the trajectory of where information security was headed was certainly achieved by the hard work and dedication of Josh, Bo, and hundreds of others. Recent events have shown us that the cavalry is needed now more than ever, but all of us should be proud of the work the, uh, uh, that the world is certainly a safer place because we exist. So I told him I would read that. Um, time permitting, I may play one short thing from Andrea Matuition as well, who helped kind of architect this before we even launched it, law professor. Um, if you ever heard me talk about the Cuyahoga River, that is hers. <laughs> um, uh, but basically, she's been working on similar problems from the legal and uh, academia perspective for a long time. Um, a couple of the accomplishments for people that are brand new, because there's always somebody brand new. Um, one of the things I said day one is uh, I don't want to find and fix a single flaw and a single medical device from a single manufacturer. I want to chain hack the rules for all medical devices. And when I watched that video yesterday, I got very emotional because we did it. Um, I'll start at the end. One of the most important achievements we had is we passed the Patch Act into law, worked on it for almost nine years to the day. You're gonna hear a lot more about that tomorrow um, from the FDA session with Bo and Suzanne Schwartz and her team, her incredibly courageous team. But that, you can't get, one of the problems with, with cybersecurity is we always say, let's focus on the low hanging fruit. But when you pick all the low hanging fruit, you know what you're left with? Really, really hard problems that take a decade to fix. But this crazy idea was let's let's have a long view. Let's do the work. Let's have a campaign. Let's not focus on activity that make us feel good, but results that make us actually safer. So the Patch Act is essentially is an acronym, but um, you'll hear more tomorrow. But at this point is law of the land that every medical device that gets approved going forward has to have be patchable, has to have a coordinated vulnerability disclosure program to work with good faith researchers without fear of legal reprisal, has to have a software bill of materials 
has to have threat models, a bunch of other stuff. She actually has specific authorities and now budget to regulate based on the cybersecurity of the device, not just the clinical effectiveness of the device. And uh, when I first pitched it to one of the staffers that you'll meet tomorrow, Jessica Wilkerson, she was in House Energy and Commerce and Young and the other uh, computer science major, uh, she, she laughed at me when I pitched that idea. It was my second briefing ever on, this, on the first day ever. She laughed at me. And I, I couldn't tell if it didn't feel cruel, but I asked, I'm like, is it funny? And she's like, oh, no, I think the idea is elegant. It's just it's going to take a decade. So during my uh, belated honeymoon with Adi last December, it, when I, I come back to the resort and my phone connects to the Internet and I got like 20 messages saying, congratulations, congratulations. I'm like, what? What did I do? <laughs> and uh, the Patch Act got squeezed in, fought for to the death against a lot of lobbying money to be in the appropriations bill. Uh, a senator from Louisiana fought, took it to the mat, and it is now law of the land. So that is uh, just one of the crowning achievements is that even though it's going to take a long time to drain the swamp of unsupported end-of-life operating systems that are not patchable, it's probably going to take 15 years, um, all hospitals, large, medium, small, rural, will benefit from a, a more defensible, resilient future. And it, I just the symmetry between, a, you know, a moonshot kind of idea 10 years ago upstairs and we've actually done it. So I called Jessica and I said, I beat you by a year because it was only nine years, <laughs> but uh, she'll tell you that tomorrow. Um, I'm almost uh, done. I wanted to give a, a little bit of a, a rundown of some of the greatest hits, but um, and then uh, 30 seconds on each talk you're going to see today and tomorrow. So I think um, most of our on the one, year one, we published a, a five star automotive cyber safety framework saying how all systems fail. This is a really simple, bare minimum way to look at cyber physical connected cars. A year later, Bo um, had translated that into the Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices using medically familiar language. We built trust with Suzanne, caused the first recall of a medical device in history with no loss of life uh, for cyber reasons. We convinced her that an unmitigated pathway to harm was enough. She started weaving in the Hippocratic Oath into their pre-market guidance around the same time to bring up a device to market, adding coordinated disclosure to her post-market guidance. The trust we built got me on a congressional task force for healthcare in 2016 and 17, which uh, put things like SBOM into the, into the high gear and then into the hands of the shiny one, Alan Friedman. Um, when the pandemic hit, actually before that, um, the Mirai botnet taking out the internet for a day scared congressmen. So Senator Warner spent a couple hours with Bo and I, and out of that conversation came the IoT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2017. Um, later testified to Will Hurd's committee on that. It failed. But during the pandemic, it was reintroduced and passed into law. So hackers caused a fucking federal law. Uh, and then when I thought uh, in parallel with that, when the pandemic hit, uh, 10 years ago, there was no CISA. There was no defensive critical infrastructure wing of the federal government. There were pieces of it in uh, NPPD and DHS, but CISA as a dedicated agency was fledgling. And then Director Krebs, when the pandemic hit the planet, uh, called me and said, would you like to serve your country for a year? So I got to design and implement what became the CISA COVID task force as the chief strategist and work with many brave people in this room that helped keep hospitals as safe as possible, vaccine supplies and other pandemic induced strains. So that was traumatizing, but also, you know, proof that people trust the cavalry's mission as not public sector, not private sector, but public good. And during that time, we did document the first statistical proof of loss of life that ransom attacks can have lethal byproducts and consequences. And as Congress digested this and the White House digested this, the ensuing actions were that despite significant lobbying, that Patch Act passed into law, our second law. Uh, and uh, the White House consulted dozens of hackers intensely to write their White House National Cybersecurity Strategy. And probably the most chills I get, even though I think we're going to blow this Overton's window and fail to act on many of the things that are queued up just because they're uncomfortable for the private sector, is that there was a day when Bo brought us all into the White House uh, for hackers in the White House 1.0 with Chris Inglis and ONCD and NCS and all the different offices. And I realized that there were about a about a dozen people working at the White House that were in and out of the cavalry influence. And they were, I don't really say it this, this way often, but I felt like the cavalry was a, a, an antidote to gatekeeping and rock star culture here and who, who had permission to do things. 
and we met anyone and everyone where they were and invested in them. And some of them are now driving the newest part of the White House and writing laws and crafting strategies. And you're going to hear from at least a couple of them today and tomorrow. Um, and it's not just U.S. I think the IoT ideas turned into U.K. law and you got a countdown clock that you'll hear about tomorrow. We're influencing EMEA. We have Klaus in Europe doing Sanders work. We have the Netherlands adopting these things. We have Japan cert all in on S-bombs. Um, we have um, uh, the British are coming tomorrow. Uh, so they want more influence on some more actions that they're thinking of for regulation. So what we started is great and it's not nearly enough. We're not gonna scale. If it took us 10 years to do the things we have, in the meantime, we're getting worse faster. Uh, there have been serious questions about, do we end the cavalry, transform it into something new, uh, or uh, combine it with other initiatives to get to critical mass? Um, and I'm gonna spend at least the next one to three months, I, I ended my private sector work on Friday. I'm jumping all in, and those that wanna help craft this, just like we did last time, uh, we said, let's have a constitutional Congress. So let, let's figure out what the next phase, the next decade should look like. As for today, real brief rundown. You're going to hear from Emma. A lot of the common theme today is target rich, but cyber poor and lifeline critical infrastructure. So Emma's going to talk about small, medium, rural facilities for electrical with David Botts, which is not just about electrical. You're going to, it's going to lay some framework for the following two talks after lunch, which is about food. So Hungry Hungry Hackers with Sick Codes and Casey John Ellis in some manner or fashion. There's been some complications there. And then Paul Roberts and those two. And, and uh, recently, former from the White House, Steve Kelly, just left the federal service and entered the private sector yesterday. And he'll be here um, to talk about food supply. After that next break, water, water everywhere with our brand new friend from last year talking, giving us an education on the water sector and exposures that water has and, and how critically important it is to hospitals, to food, to everything, to electrical. We'll, we'll, and then we'll wrap the day up with uh, Spanky and Ion uh, crossing paths in and out of federal service towards, towards and from hackers uh, to show that anybody and everyone can make the world safer irrespective of their origin. We'll give you a rundown on tomorrow later today, but thank you for joining us for the intro. And uh, shortly, you'll get to hear about some target-rich cyber poor in areas like food, water, emergency care, and electrical, which desperately need our help. Thank you.